Well, hello, friends, and welcome back to Embrace the Question. I'm excited to be with you this week. We are in our 44th lesson in Genesis. Can you believe that? Only the 39th chapter, but our 44th lesson, so we are making headway. I'm excited about that. I think that when we're done with Genesis, we're going to be able to look back at these the series of lessons and have a really good starting spot on pretty much any future Bible study we want to do. Any more deep diving or, you know, just getting into Torah subjects in general, we will have a very good foundation for that. So I'm excited about that. But let's kind of level set now on, on chapter 39. We continue our study of Joseph. Now, we were interrupted last week, weren't we, with the study of Judah and his exploits with Tamar. And we talked about that. We talked about the possibilities of why that was interjected into our story, seemingly, you know, right after we get started with Joseph, now we're interrupted by Judah. So let's level set again on Joseph. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw some slides up here so that you can see some parallels between Joseph and Jesus so far. In case, you know, it'll serve as a bit of a refresher for us, but it'll also help us stay on track with what we're looking for as far as parallels go. Okay, and then we'll start and we'll actually get into chapter 39. All right, let's, let's do it. We'll sneak back to Genesis 37, verses 3 and 4. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. All right, I would parallel this to John 15, 25, which reads, But this cometh to pass, that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So in both cases, we see Joseph and Jesus are unfairly hated. They are, they are hated without a cause. And... Those the writers made special efforts to make this obvious, I think. All right, let's let's proceed to the next one, Genesis 37, 18. And when they, his brothers, saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. In Matthew 26, 4, we find, and they consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him or subtlety and kill him. So in both cases, we have conspiracy to kill this um, annoyance to them. So far, we're tracking pretty good that the stories are lining up. Genesis 37, 26 and 27. And Judah said unto his brethren, what profit is it? If we slay our brother and conceal his blood, come and let us sell him. Now in Matthew 26, 15, and said unto them, what will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. So that would be Judas. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And that also, I think, reels in another passage from the Old Testament, Zechariah 11, 12 and 13, 11, uh, chapter 11, Verses 12 and 13. And I said unto them, If you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price thirty pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it under the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. And I took the thirty pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. That is such an incredible passage right there because it's completely prophetic. It completely describes what's going to happen. It even gives us a hint of the Lord's attitude towards it, which is sheer sarcasm. That's a goodly price. 30 pieces of silver. 
the price of a female slave, if you want to know how that ties back into Torah. But that is the conspiracy to sell Jesus and to sell Joseph. That's why I think back in uh, our synopsis of Genesis 37, I made mention, it would have been interesting if we had known exactly how much they sold Joseph to the Midianites for. I wonder if it was 30 pieces of silver or if they made a lot better on him than that. Okay, that kind of brings us back up to where we are at. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 39 now. All right, Genesis 39, verse one, we're in the English Standard Version. That's, right now, that's my favorite version. And I wonder, do any of you guys have this version in hard copy? I don't think I do. I have a Bible collection and I do not have the ESV in hard copy. Isn't that an oddity? Just wondering if any of you guys have that one. Let me know, and if you have one, if you like it, and where you purchased it. I'd appreciate that information. Here we go. Verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. And notice the, the descriptors. Down to Egypt brought him down there. These are intentional. Egypt was not a place of, you don't ascend into Egypt. You would go down to Egypt in the Jewish mind, okay? Important, I think. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight and attended him. And he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. I've, I've already highlighted that phrase because it seems to pop up over and over again here. The Lord's favor is upon Joseph. Joseph is in Egypt, a place where... You really don't want to look up and find yourself in that day if you are not Egyptian. And spiritually speaking, we've all been there. We all look up sometimes and find ourselves in Egypt, which is a realm where we are in bondage to something. And that's what this is going to become synonymous with. A place where it's hard to get out of if you ever get into it. Egypt. Okay. Uh, secondly, though, Joseph is a slave. And we can address the slavery issue through this. I mean, it's from this point on, slavery is going to be an integral part of the story of Israel. And it's really starting here with Joseph, the first one sold into slavery. And we have, I think, a really good example of how this relationship, if it exists, how it should work. Now, I know that sounds weird, and it might even sound a bit blasphemous to some, some people, but slavery was a fact of life back in the day, right? Back then, it was, it was just a, a way of life, and the Bible gives us very good, good instruction on how to, one, treat your slaves if you're a master, and treat your master if you're a slave, because that was information they needed. There were slaves who read scriptures. There were masters who read scriptures. They needed instruction on how to do this in a godly way, because it was a way of life for these people. So Joseph is a slave, and he is being a really good one. Okay, you, you could even say he's not really a slave anymore. He's more just of a servant. Paul talked about bond servitude, bond servant, where you actually, you, you were a servant because of a debt, but when your debt was paid, you loved this way of life so much. It was a good way of life. 
it was work and you were paid well. You had a place to stay, you had things to eat, you were you were sheltered, and you had you had good people that you served and they took care of you, and you were literally just a part of the family at that point. And that's when you could choose to remain on that uh, remain on the roster, so to speak. You could continue to be the servant to that family. That's how it was supposed to work. That's how the slave master relationship was supposed to be. We all know that it wasn't always. And but it seems to be at this point for Joseph. Potiphar is loving him and he is loving Joseph and Potiphar is making him in charge of everything. That's pretty cool. That's that's gratifying even to read. Okay? So Let's continue on with verse 5. From that time, or from the time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. All right. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. That reminds us a bit, I think, of Jacob working for Laban. And while Jacob was kind of just one of the one of the shepherds for Laban because he was working for uh, Leah and Rachel. Everything that Laban had prospered. His flocks, everything. Everything multiplied. It might also remind you of a story that we're going to find, I think it's in Samuel, where the Ark of the Covenant comes to rest in the house of Obed-Edom. Now, the Ark of the Covenant had been on a procession on a cart to Jerusalem. It had tipped, and Uzzah reached up to steady the Ark, and he was killed immediately by the power of God because the Ark wasn't being carried properly. And it was kind of a downer. It spoiled the party. It rained on the parade, literally. And so David said, okay, we need a place we can put this. It's not time to bring this into Jerusalem yet. So they steered the cart over into the property of Obed-Edom. And the presence of God, which is what we're talking about here, the presence of God was in the house of Obed-Edom. And Obed-Edom's house prospered for those years that the ark stayed in his house. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's what we're talking about, is the presence of God being in a place. In that case, it was in the ark. In this case, it's in a person. In the, in the former case with Jacob at Laban's house, the favor of God was on Jacob. So the presence of God was with Laban and all that he had prospered. So that's what's going on. Verse 6. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. I, that that kind of caught me a little bit because, remember, he's got good genealogy going on here. We're not told much about uh, Jacob's looks or uh, other than he was softer than Esau or Isaac, or Abraham, but we know about the wives, don't we? Abraham married Sarah. Kings wanted Sarah. Uh, Isaac and Rebecca. Kings wanted Rebecca. These, I mean, some really good genetics running in the line here. So it's not a huge surprise that Joseph's a good-looking dude, okay? Handsome in form and appearance. Verse 7, and after a time, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. So he's getting attention that he doesn't need or want. Verse 8, but he refused and said to his master's wife, behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house. And he has put everything that he has in my charge. He's, put every, he's given me everything. He is not greater in this house than I am. Listen to that. My master is not greater in this house than I am. He's given me all the authority in the house. That kind of is starting to remind me a little bit of what Jesus told the church, his disciples about the church. 
all authority has been given to me. I am bequeathing that authority to you on the earth. Even as I am, so are you on the earth. So my master is not greater in this house than I am. Are you seeing some of these pictures? I don't know that I've actually ever seen that before just now. That's exciting. Okay. Nor has he kept back anything from me except you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He didn't say sin against Potiphar. He said, I would be sinning against God. Joseph understands reality. He's not worried about the seen realm. He's worried about the unseen realm. Something that I don't think a lot of us are. We, we are a lot more aware of the seen ramifications than we are anything about the unseen realm. Much like Judah in the former chapter. Judah was never afraid of God. He was just afraid of what people would think. The seen realm. Joseph has his stuff together here spiritually. No wonder God's favor is just pouring through him at this point. And she spoke to Joseph day after day. He would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. Verse 11, But one day when he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house, she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. All right. He got out of the house, verse 13, And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. That's She's talking about her husband now. He has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. She's pretty, pretty spiteful here. This woman is a woman that feels rejected and she's angry about it because she has been rejected and then she laid up his garment by her until his master came home and she told him the same story saying the hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came into me to laugh at me but as soon as i lifted up my voice and cried he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house as soon as the master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled. You know, what it doesn't say here is whom his anger was kindled at. Now, we are I think a lot of times we assume that Potiphar got angry with Joseph. And I can't prove that he wasn't. But it says his anger was kindled, and I believe his anger was kindled because he knew good and well what was going on. You, if he had any kind of relationship at all with this woman whom he was married to, he would have known her. Because I promise you, he already knew Joseph and knew Joseph's integrity. So if Potiphar is angry here, it's probably not at Joseph. It's probably at the situation slash his wife. But guess what kind of position he is in? He is an official of Pharaoh. He is an important man socially. So he is going to have to save face. Guess who's going to catch the brunt of that one? And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. Okay, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. The king's prisoners were probably treated a little bit better in some circumstances. It was probably a more dangerous place to be, obviously, because it's, you know, you're a prisoner of the king. However, some of those may have been political prisoners or, or, uh, I don't, I don't know how you would say uh, keeping, keeping uh, prisoners of war, maybe important prisoners of war, people that weren't necessarily tortured, but were kept under lock and key. Okay. 
that's my assumption here because I'm not a, an Egyptian historian, but here we find Joseph is now a prisoner of the king, verse 22, and the keeper of the prison did what? He put Joseph in charge of all, <laughs> he, of all, he put Je Joseph in charge of all, all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. What do you think that would be like? I mean, that would be about the best circumstance of prison you could possibly imagine. Here I am, I'm in, I'm in the king's dungeons, but there's this guy named Joseph that has locked me up and he's really kind to me and he sees that I don't get moldy bread and he sees that I get all the water I need and he basically keeps me informed of what's going on in the outside world. It's just about as good as prison can be because of Joseph. So we see that he is blessing the world because of his relationship with God, because of his integrity spiritually. So whatever was done there, Joseph was the one who did it. Wow. For a prisoner to have that kind of pull in a prison. Verse 23, and the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. You should highlight that one too. The Lord made it succeed. What's great about that is it's, it's, a, it's a tiny little nugget that you could actually read through it and not pay any attention to it. But when you and I are going through life, there, we, we find ourselves in positions where there is no good outcome. I was there this week and just, I had a problem in the computing world and it was falling to me. It was a connection that was broken and I had no answers. And in that situation, I'm always very quick nowadays to just pray because the best computer guy in the world is Holy Spirit. He knows how all of them work. He understands. I don't know. I don't know how he does what he does, but he's really, really good at it. And things just resolved. Things just resolve. He, he has this ability to make you succeed. Nobody else can do this. He can make you succeed. That just defies, I don't really have a, a matrix for that. Now, so here's the, here's the interesting thing. And I think one of the great things about the story of Joseph, and that is we can place ourselves into the story of Joseph at multiple levels. Okay. We, we've already seen him in his childhood. He's a bit brash. He's a bit, mm, He's a braggart, right? He irritates his brothers and doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut. And anyone ever been there? I've, I've been there. I've been in places where I didn't know better than to just, hey, shut up, Steve. You're not helping anybody or anything by flapping your gums more. So I've been there. I relate. I understand that. And not only that, but it's, it's a common problem people have. They just don't know when to quit. But now, you know, we've seen him here, I think, matured. We don't know how much time has gone by. We assume not too much, but Joseph seems to have matured here. We're seeing great maturity on display because of his integrity. And he's, if you will, kind of in the workplace now. He's in corporate Egypt corporate America. He's working in the system. And he's every, and the Lord's making everything he does succeed. And now he's gotten the demotion. Now he's 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 been passed over, he's been demoted. He's been he's been canned if you want to put it that way. And yet, everything he's doing is succeeding because his faith, his integrity hasn't taken a hit. 
So this really, this story will continue and we will see more layers of Joseph that we can actually put ourselves, probably associate with at some level in our own lives. And it becomes valuable because none of that stuff has gone out of style or season. Faith, integrity, trust in God, all of that stuff plays a part in your success today. So I think that is pretty amazing. This story of Joseph will continue to educate us in, in some things that we don't get to talk about very often. So I hope you enjoyed that lesson. I did. I, I think that's pretty powerful. It's not a long chapter, 23 verses. But the story of Joseph is very, like his coat, very colorful. And there's nothing quite like it. Nothing quite like this story. There's more detail in this story than we find in a lot of cases in the life of Jesus. So if we deduce some similarities from Joseph and transport them over to the story of Jesus, we might find a little bit more accurate, uh, more resolution in our story of Jesus as well. So we'll, we'll keep that in mind as we move forward. Hope you guys are having a great week, and I will talk to you next time, okay? Peace.